the biggest mistake people make. They don't live intentionally with their income. They kind of just spend it with whatever. So being intentional. So a monthly budget is simply your income for the month minus all of your expenses, including giving and saving, but it all equals zero. So every dollar coming in from your paycheck is assigned to a category. Rachel Cruz is a national expert on the topic of finance and budgeting, a Ramsey personality and a number one New York Times bestselling author. She's known for practical and actionable advice around money. Aside from being a Women's Day magazine contributor, she's appeared on GMA, Live with Kelly and Ryan, The Today Show. Her new book, Know Yourself, Know Your Money, will help us diagnose our money personality so we can set ourselves straight for 2021. Rachel, thank you for being back with us here. Thank you, Maria. Thanks for having me back on. Um, Well, we're excited because, you know, it's a new year and everyone wants to start the new year right in many categories and financially, of course, being probably, aside from our health, one of the most important. Um, So I think you're doing us such a service with this book because knowing who you are is so important to get to where you want to go in every aspect of life. But I've never heard anybody really talk about it in the financial kind of way. So it was great. And then we all took the quiz here to know our money personality. And I think maybe we probably start with that because let's just get right to it. So Jeff has all of our results. He knows what we've all, you know, (laughs) tested out to be. And the the game is on. So um, Kevin, are you here with us? I am here. Oh, Kevin is so <laughs> Kevin depressed. is nervous. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> All right. Rachel, I will start with our queen, of course, Maria Menounos. Um, she was diagnosed with a strong safety-focused mindset, a strong scarcity mentality, <laughs> and she's billed as an extreme saver. And as you get to know a bit of both how Kevin and Maria grew up, I think it'll be a very interesting way to see how their classroom factors into their current money spending but let me just keep going i'll just give you all of hold us. on in one fact, second so i like right. i like what you just said jeff because so the whole point of this first of all we'll have our fun shaming each other for our different things but um <laughs> the whole point of this is we want to know who we are why we became who we are so that we can figure out using the strengths and the weaknesses and 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 accordingly so the money classroom is i think super interesting so there are four money classrooms that you talk yes. about um and it really is based on kind of what we grew up with right that's right yeah so So your home growing up you could say was your classroom in every aspect of life that's where you learned your lessons mm -hmm. and then you went out into adulthood and you decided okay these are lessons that i want to take with me here are some lessons i wish i could unlearn from my family but you take those lessons with you and depending on your money tendencies and your personality is how those lessons really affected you but your childhood growing up yeah was that classroom and it was a huge part of your money story today Okay, so Jeff, I'm an extreme saver, which I learned from my dad. And so now Jeff, continue. Um, again, the, the safety-focused minds. Oh, this is, I'm going to move on to Kevin. Okay, okay, so this is, of course, our listeners know, but if you're new to the show, this is Maria's <laughs> husband. <laughs> you guys, uh, and business partner. And I think you guys have um, diametrically opposed philosophies <laughs> with money. So uh, I'm reading Kevin's results now. He is an extreme spender. So you're both on the extreme side. Um, He also has a moderate scarcity mindset, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So you kind of share that. And also a strong safety focused mindset. So you share some things, but you completely diverge in your philosophy towards saving or spending. I like to think that we complement each other, Rachel. And I like to think that he's more moderate scarcity because he grew up poor and then went to the rich town. He grew up in Medford and then went to Winchester. I just grew up poor and we kind of stayed there. (laughs) So (laughs) I never got to moderate. You know what I mean? We just were always scared for money. Just extreme. Just extreme. Yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, no, I love it because I'm like, okay, neither one's right or wrong, right? So the spender, the saver, it's not right or wrong. Now, if you do go to the extremes constantly, that can get a little unhealthy. You do want a little bit of moderation, if you will. But I'm I lean way more on the spender side. My husband leans way more on the on the saver side. So you go down the list and usually opposites attract. So that's good that some of your foundational principles, though, right, is similar. So Mm you sure you see eye to eye maybe on more things with money than other couples. Not necessarily. But I think (laughs) I think I can I can break it down to water. Okay, this is how I explain Kevin and I's relationship financially when it comes to water. I 
and like water's free at home. He will go to 7-Eleven and buy the big, huge water bottles. He'll buy three of them. And I'm like, you're not going to drink three of them. It's going to end up in the car. Now we've wasted money. By the way, you would think I have nothing <laughs> no money. Like, I'm a sick human being. Okay, except he drinks all three of them. And then Maria somehow w- wakes up like, wait, how are you 54 years old? And how did you pull off a year and a half renovation for, what, 3% of the budget of your high-end Hollywood contractor in, in a matter of three and a half months, seven days a week, 16 hours a day doing physical labor in the worst heat? How did that happen? Because oh, he had the three bottles of water. Yeah, maybe because I drink <laughs> He was about, hydrated. He was right? hydrated. No, it's but I do, I do whatever it takes to keep my body going, and that I do in lieu of the, I don't know, hydrocolonics, let's say, that all the L.A. people get and all the money they spend on their stuff, you know. I go the regular guy approach. But here's the thing. H2O. I'm basically, Rachel, painting you the picture of the extremes. And yes, what's yes. good is I would still have every penny I'd ever earned in the bank, but because of him, I've invested in my career, which actually is much smarter in the long run. Yes. But I would have been terrified because of the way I grew up. So we'll continue with the um, diagnoses of, yes. of okay. Jeff so, and um, Kelsey. And then you can share with us what you see and then how you would guide us to the next level. Um, so I'll start with my fabulous co-producer and partner in crime, Kelsey. Um, Kelsey, I'll actually throw to you because you have your results in there. Yes, I do. So, Rachel, I started to briefly tell this to you guys, and then we were going to save it for air because I know Maria is going to say you're kidding. But here we go. (laughs) I got extreme saver, moderate scarcity mindset, and strong safety focus mindset. So why Maria is going to disagree is because I am a consumer. She's I, a huge consumer, I, Rachel. I have to be the one to tell the truth here. I'm just kidding. I lived I with her for months, so I know what? this girl loves to shop. And I do. I'm a consumer. <laughs> I'm definitely a consumer. But I also was the kid who I worked since I was in seventh grade. And I always had a little piggy bank stuffed in hiding in my closet that I would put all of my cash in there. Which Always. is scarcity mindset for sure. Yep. Yes, that's fascinating. No one in my family knew about it. My mom claimed she did. <laughs> she didn't. She definitely did it. And I always have a hard time. Like if I would get a wad or whatever, I couldn't spend it on anything. I was like, no, no, no. I need to save it. And I have a savings that I always put money into every month. So, so which so, is so. super impressive. I feel like she's a really healthy balance probably. I was going to say on the spender saver scale, yes, that that's like that's ideal right there, right? I'm a natural saver, but I've learned how to, how to spend some money, how to enjoy life a little bit, but I'm not extreme. Whereas a spender for me, I can go too extreme and I could just be going. I mean, like if I, I mean, I'm like, yeah, just cash out the 401k. We'll figure something out, right? I mean, not really, <laughs> but like, but like that's, that would be my, my bents, which would be unhealthy. So my moderate is to say, no, I love to spend money. I have an easy time spending money. I don't have guilt or shame over it. I have a budget. I know what to spend. I'm good. But I've had to learn to save. And I do mm-hmm. save. I save first before I spend. I mean, I've had to put things in place in my life. So again, it's the same ideal idea that those extremes can get unhealthy, but that moderation is key. Sounds Your like you got dad it too. would nice. disown you if you weren't a saver in some respect. You couldn't be a Ramsey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> well, because saving offers a level of peace, right? And like mm-hmm. a level of freedom that you're like, yeah, I have options when I actually have money in the bank versus when you are living paycheck to paycheck. So so for me though, I I would rather outwork my spending habits than to save for things. Does that make Ooh. sense? Like I would rather like be like, oh no, no, I'll just I'll just work a little extra. I'll just no, I'll do a little bit more so that I can do things. But which Got is it. more of a status side. So one of the spectrums was status versus safety. And a lot of you guys were safety, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. My husband's on that, where I'm a little bit more on the status side, which sounds bad. It's not bad, but I worked, I work to spend. Like I work to go buy a great car or I work to go on a nice vacation where my husband's like, no, 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 we work to have money in the bank just in case something happens. Yeah. Like, you know, and again, in moderation, neither one of these are extremes, but that's kind of my mindset. So I would rather work to spend than work to save. If that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Jeff, really you're the final. Well, speaking of unhealthy extremes, <laughs> I am an extreme saver. Let me just tell you, Rachel, as I was like raising the ranks as a producer in Hollywood, I was still sleeping on a deflating air mattress in a shared room. And it wasn't until I got married that my wife, who's probably too much of a spender, was like, dude, 
you can't sleep on an air mattress that's deflating and then go to a job to say that you're producing a show in Hollywood. And I was like, you know, she's right. So I have a <laughs> strong, strong saver mentality. Let me just pull it up real quick. Yeah, I'm a extreme saver with a scarcity mentality and a strong safety focused mindset. Jeff, okay. tell everyone where they can take similar. this test. Yes, and you can. we're gonna link it in the description. You can take this test um, below in the YouTube video or the podcast, but uh, it's also on Rachel's website. Yeah. Perfect. So Rachel, now you have all of our diagnoses. You know our money personalities. It seems like me, Jeff, and Kelsey are all on the same page. And then we've got our rebel, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got, and, and it's so funny because working on your shit, like what you're doing, I think would lend to exactly how your results were. Like that feels very predictable, if you will. Hmm. And so again, it's this level of being wise. So moderation in everything in life, I feel like I've learned over the scope of my years here on earth, is healthy, right? Like if you go extreme on anything, you just kind of get stuck in this black and white mentality. Like having a little bit of that moderation to say, okay, there is a balance. There is a balance. We're not going to go spend everything we make. And I made the joke about cashing out the 401k. Like, like we're not going to do that. That's, that's stupid. You're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But you're also not going to be a hoarder and hold money so tightly that number one, you're not living life. And then number two, there's a level of unhealthy emotion with money that it becomes too much of a safety net. Or, and I felt this, I was, I'd be curious if you have, if you relate to this at all, because like for me on paper, my husband Winston and I, we've married 11 years and we've been doing this stuff for 11 years. So we're in a place financially on paper that we're great. Like we are, we're fine. Again, we've been doing it for 11 years and that's where we are. But even during the pandemic, like July, August, September, there were multiple nights I would go to bed. I'm like, are we going to be okay? Like is stuff going to just hit the fan in this world? And like, what's going to happen? Like, there were those days that early on, especially that we had no clue what was going to happen. And I found myself, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm allowing money to be my, like, to be that safety net. And that safety net was never really shaken for me until this pandemic. And it was more emotional again, not as tactical, but man, I felt it shake for the first time. So then I think there is a level where it can be unhealthy, where you put too much of your safety and security money. Cause what if it all goes away? Like, what if that happens? Who are you? You know, your identity and where you're grounded in life and your character is extremely important in this process. And I feel like we can chase after money so much and our net worth becomes our self-worth. But if that number from the bank disappears, who are you the next day? And I think those are questions we have to ask ourselves if you do lean on that safety mentality, which I realize I probably do more. So as you said that, I thought of the person who did wake up and has nothing, a restaurant owner or you know, a waitress. And I have the chills all the way down my body just thinking of what that feels like. Mm. So when you say you need to know who you are for that moment, how does that help that person? And how do you guide them in that moment? Yeah, I think there's a level of stability in life that you have to put your value and principles around. And whether that's a spiritual walk, whether that's family, whatever that is, it's like almost things money can't buy. And there's a level of putting investment of your time and your energy into those things in life that is really important because like all this material stuff we have is great. And I always say, I think I said it on your last podcast probably, that it's okay to have nice stuff. Just don't let your nice stuff have you. And I think in America, our stuff just owns us. Like our value and who we are is defined by our cars, by our houses, mm -hmm. by if our uh, inflatable mattress has a hole or not. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, like man, it just defines who we are. And that's scary when all of your identity is wrapped into that stuff. And so I think you just have to check yourself. And again, I like to see what are things money can't buy because mm -hmm. that's the stuff that's going to outlast. But how do you pick yourself up when you have nothing? Yes. Well, if that's the case on a tactical level, there is a, a real truth that when you do have your finances in order and a strong financial foundation, that you are going to have a level of peace that is good. Like I'm not saying, you know, all obviously we teach this stuff. So I'm a firm believer in getting yourself in a place financially where you have peace. That is what I want. Cause for so many people, yeah, their money controls them. So if you are that person that did wake up during the pandemic and you were furloughed, you lost your job, maybe you had your own business and it went under to figure out, okay, what are the things I can control? And so there are industries that went completely gone. And I mean, they're still not recovered and there's others that have elevated. And so maybe it's a career change for a short period of time, but whatever it is to bring in that income is so key. Cause when you can bring in that income, you can control that money. When that paycheck hits your account, you can control what's going on there. And so being wise with that, putting an emergency fund in place. So I would say save, save, save. If you still are on the cusp of like, oh, I don't know if I'm okay or not, 
pause everything, even retirement, I don't care, pause everything and just save cash. And then when you get to a place with a little bit more stability, then I'd say start working your way out of debt and then building up a fully funded emergency fund after that. I love it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the money classrooms because we touched on it earlier, but I'd love for you to go through the four money classrooms and then you can kind of figure out where we all fall into that. And we can kind of share a little bit about it because, you know, it's, it's, that's how people kind of connect. I feel like once they kind of hear their story, cause we're all going to have yes. a similar story at some point. Yes. Yeah. It's fascinating. So money, again, like we said earlier, it was learned in this classroom. So money's communicated in two ways. It's communicated verbally, but it's also commu communicated emotionally. So that first money classroom is the anxious money classroom. And this is where it's verbally closed. So not talked about and emotionally stressed. So if you grew up in an anxious money classroom, you felt tension around money, maybe at the end of the month when bills were due and you felt it around the house, around your parents or your parents but you didn't really know why, because it wasn't talked about, but man, you felt that tension. Classroom number two is the unstable money classroom, and this is where it's verbally open, but emotionally stressed. So lots of conflict, lots of fighting. Maybe you heard your parents have the same money fight over and over again. Maybe they fought with extended family members, but there was conflict. And then classroom number three is the unaware money classroom, and this is where it's verbally closed, but emotionally calm. So it wasn't talked about, but you never felt tension about it, right? So it was just kind of like your head was in the sand. You almost didn't even think about money until you went off on your own and you realized, oh, wow, I'm gonna have to like learn all of this because again, it was never talked about. And then classroom number four, it's the healthiest money classroom. And this is where it's verbally open and emotionally calm. So there's a level of control over the money. There's a plan in place, but also it's talked about. It's talked about within family members. It's talked about within kids. You even have the ability, yeah, talk about it with your friends, not like, here's how much money I make, but talk about you know what, what you're doing, maybe your goals in life, but you're comfortable talking about the subject. So that's classroom number four. And I encourage my readers in the book to where they are presently to kind of move to that classroom number four, start talking about money, even when it's hard and get a plan in place so that your emotions have more peace um, than, than high intensity, if you will. So, but going back to say, okay, here's how I grew up. One of those four classrooms is really important because they all come with negatives. Even classroom number four can come with some negative things. So to be able to pinpoint it, cause you'll see, and I'll be curious what you guys say, either people just mirror what they know and don't even really realize it until like, wow, that's why I do it. Or they do the extreme opposite. And they say, wow, I grew up with parents that spent all the time and now all I want to do is save. Mm -hmm. Or my, my, my mom was an extreme tightwad and all she did was save money. And now that I finally have money, I just want to spend it all. So it's interesting. You either sit, mm. kind of mirror it or you do the opposite. Kev, I feel like you wanted to do the opposite. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, we, they were extreme, extreme, extreme. And uh, you know, I just wanted to rebel. So every time I had money, I'm like, F that, I'm spending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kels? You know, I feel like I would probably say four, honestly. My dad, my dad was such a tightwad and still is, and he's still very, but he's an incredible saver. And it was always, it was the very opposite. So my mom was like, I want to buy this next glass of wine. Whenever my dad was like, mm, probably not. We probably shouldn't. So I think that's kind of where my tendencies come in. It's like, I have the saver part of me, but then I also see my mom's point of view. So I'm like, no, I'm going to spend, I'm going to be a consumer. So yeah. Did y'all talk about money growing up? I'm just curious of like the tactical side of it. The emotional we did. Side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my dad was very, I mean, Yes and no. And I'm interested to hear what you think. Like he was very much like he wanted us to learn the value of it. And like he wanted us to learn stocks and we have stock meetings and we have this and that. Not as much emotional, though, but definitely the tactical. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is, I think, probably way more common. Like if money was talked about, it probably was on that tactical side. Right. Like here's. Yeah. Here's what a mutual fund is. Let me show exactly. you. Exactly. Or you, or here's you make your money Roth. as a little six year old. Yeah. Here's yep. what you do with it. But the emotional side's interesting, you know, talking about things like contentment, mm. talking about generosity, talking about almost the bigger picture of money um, that, that has more of that emotional wrapping versus just that tactical. But I would say the tactical, I mean, any, any time it's talked about, I think is a win. So yeah. I think that's awesome that yeah. your parents dove into those conversations. Yeah. We literally have stock meetings. It's what, <laughs> but it's great. Yeah. It's great. Awesome. He and I, like we used to, 
Um, and my sister, too, the three of us used to go to Charles Schwab, Schwab and it would be like Doug's outing. But hilarious. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I feel like right. we grew up like my parents were immigrants. My dad, you know, they were janitors. And, you know, there were periods where because they worked so hard and they cleaned so many massive nightclubs where there was actually like a good flow of money for what that time was because we used to collect all the cans, we would make the money off the cans. And so even though they did, you know, hard labor, they were able to make a good living. But then when the nightclub, you know, filed for chapter 11 and, you know, went down, we had some really, really hard times where we didn't even have money for food on the table mm. until my dad was able to locate more work. And so, but I remember my dad investing and talking about investing um, mutual funds were a big thing. Mutual funds mm -hmm. and CDs. I remember CDs, but you couldn't <laughs> yeah. touch them. And I remember my dad just being such an extreme saver, always saying we don't have any money. There was never, it was never a yes. Dad, can I? No. Dad, can I? No. So then when I turned 13, I was like, I'm starting to work because that's the only way I'm going to get anything. And First, it was like, oh, I'm going to work and I'm going to buy that cute shirt at Express. And I'll never forget. It was a white ruffled bodysuit. And yes. I bought it and it was $52. And it was friggin' like my whole check. But um, after that, I ended up having to kind of pitch in and help with bills and things like that. Mm. Um, and so I just remember thinking... I need to make a lot of money because I never want to be in this situation. So I mean, can I add oh. to it? Because your dad, his, her dad's probably my one of my best friends, if not my best friend. Mm. It, we work mm. together every day. And we have a lot of fun <laughs> together. But uh, he was amazing to me because this was a guy from a village, no running water. I think a lot of uh, first generation kids from different cultures know a parent like this. They're very frugal with money. They work really hard, um, but very wise as well. I think mm -hmm. what happened with Maria, though, was uh, – and he's, he knows when to spend money, too. Mm -hmm. Like, he's always like, spend money on your business. Invest in yourself. Like, he's um, – Well, we did save money in the piggy bank. So he, he cut a hole in a helium tank, and we started putting any loose change in there. And when we opened it, there was $10,000. <gasps> oh, my god! And with that money – he was like, we're going to Greece to see where we're from. He wanted to take us to Greece. And we bought mm. a new bedroom set for each of us. And oh. my dad got a new car. <laughs> yeah, and he's oh amazing gosh. like that. And I think what happened with Ma Maria was is that when they hit the hard times, I feel like there was a little bit of trauma with Maria where she, it got so thin that she was like, okay, it's dog eat dog. And now I've got to work really hard and save everything. So she's more... <laughs> I'll go to him. We, we did a little sidetrack here, but you know, if you like Hollywood, you might like this story. I was making a feature film uh, over ten years ago, and I had a chance to have Christopher Lloyd in the movie. Mm. And it was a, it was a, it was a little money, but not a lot. And Maria said, "No, absolutely not." And I went. I was to in her, charge of the budget, Rachel, yeah, and course. I you wanted to like stay on budget. <laughs> I said no to Melissa McCarthy too. By the way. <gasps> oh no! <laughs> you <Yes>. asshole. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> so I literally, so then she, she that no to Melissa, Melissa was unknown by then. It but was I, a second before she became But known. I knew she was going to be huge her, yeah. as I knew Maria was going to be huge as I usually, that's kind of my business. I know. <clears throat> and, um, and Maria said no. Uh, and so, but, but then she said no to Christopher Lloyd. And I said, I said, okay, that's it. And I went to her dad, you know, again, and th this is who he is. He was like, are you kidding me? He, he's like, yeah, and he, you know, his accent's funny. He said, he goes, even people from the church know Christopher Lloyd. Of course, you got to put him in the movie. <laughs> but Maria became, I think that's what happened. And yeah. so we, you know, for me, I'm I'm very much a believer investing in your business and investing in yourself. So all the joking aside for the spending, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And that's where we uh, probably come to a thing. But I think that Maria, just as a as an, uh, party that's been with you guys for 20 years, I just, mm -hmm. I'm offering that uh, to you, to, to well, yeah. Rachel. I think that's good. There was, there's two things you said that I was like, yes. Number one, I think it's, and it's specifically for people that have immigrated to America. Technically, they are 12 times more likely to become millionaires 
than an average person just born in America, which I think is fascinating wow. because they take this idea that, well, I can make something of myself here. And they really believe in it. They really, really believe in it. And they have a huge why. There is a big why when you come from something and you come to America and you say, I'm going to, cause they came for some reason. Right. And so they're like, okay, my, my, my why with my family, my why, while we moved here, it is so big. It's so beyond me that I'm willing to do whatever it is. I'm willing to scrub toilets at a nightclub. Like I'm willing to do what it takes. And that why is, is gone now. And I hate that. Cause I'm like, no, that's one of my things with people. Like you have to have your why, mm -hmm. why do you want, want to win with money? And it has to be bigger than yourself. And so when it's your family, oh, there's a motivation there. So I loved hearing that. And then in the book we talk about in the, in the uh, classrooms that we all have money milestones. And so there's these moments in our life that kind of put this checkpoint in our head. One of my friends, he said he went uh, grocery shopping with his mom and she'd always buy day old bread because it was half off. And then he went with a friend and the mom was pulling out all these loaves off of the grocery store shelves. And he asked her what she was doing. And she said, well, I'm looking for the freshest loaf of bread and I'm looking at the expiration date. And he was like, oh, so then he goes back to the grocery store with his mom and he says, mom, look, you can find the freshest bread if you look at the expiration date. And he was like nine years old. And she said, no, 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 no. We have to get the one that's expired because it's half off. And he said, in that moment, I realized, oh, wow. Okay. This is, there's something here. Okay. You know, so like we all have those moments in our lives. That it's like this milestone moment. And so for you, you had those mm -hmm. and it points back to a lot of what made you who you are today in such a beautiful way. So that's so cool. Nice. So, so great. Well, I just remember a lot of stressful times. It was awful. It was so stressful in the house, mm. not having money and the panic and the fear and all of that. And I just, and you know, my dad was a severe type one diabetic and watching him almost die all the time. It was just like, there was oh. a lot of fear. And mm. so I just was like, I got to get us out of this. And so I yeah. was like laser focused. That's why I made it at 22 or whatever. Was I 23 honey or 22? 22. 22. Yeah. 22. It's amazing. Um, amazing. Cause I was like, I, I got to get us out of this. So, but I think, um, you know, Jeff, you had a different upbringing, so I, I'd be curious to hear how you became an extreme saver. Um, so it's interesting, Rachel. I'm actually like kind of Ramsey, born and bred, but starting with my marriage. So up until that time, I feel like, and with you think of the Ramsey demo, and like I did grow up in that Protestant home, that great Midwestern upper middle class, but our family never talked about money, and mm. it's interesting because we've talked about our faith, our emotional wellness doing well in school, achieving in sports, but never about money. And because I grew up in a financially stable home where we never talked about it, I know I'm in that unaware classroom. And I had to do a lot of work in my, like during college in my early twenties to learn about money because I'm never going to say my parents didn't do an amazing job raising me because they did. But I think if they had taken the Ramsey class, they would have raised us differently because I knew nothing. And I had to learn. I honestly don't spend because I'm afraid of money and I've gotten better but that is kind of embedded in me because I just don't know the rules, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. That, that, and that is like, that's the classic unaware classroom, right? It was like, yeah, it, everything was kind of fine. It felt fine, whether it was or not, but you didn't even know because it wasn't even talked about. And so that growth of exactly what you said, going out on your own and really having to discover and unpack a lot of this, you had to do on your own mm -hmm. um, versus it being part of the environment. So yeah. That, so Rachel, that, what that does the on. unknown mean? Like, so, and Jeff, like when you say I was afraid of money, were you afraid of money because you didn't know where you stood with money and then, and then you didn't know if you could spend or anything. So you defaulted to save. Exactly. Like for me, and again, I have to thank you and your dad, Rachel, because I wouldn't have learned any of this without Ramsey solutions, but yeah, I just like for, you know, Laura has helped so much even me grow in my career, you know, Kevin, you talk about needing to spend to grow and spend, you know, and I think I wouldn't have been spending anything. And when you're saving that much, you're preventing yourself from e experiencing new things and achieving new things. Because again, I just didn't have the knowledge. And because I was raised in an environment where we didn't talk about it, I just didn't spend. I just, you know, kind of just lived my life in a way that limited myself because I was actually afraid to spend. Well, and there's also, I wonder, was there at all a feeling, and I could be wrong, so tell me if I'm off base, mm -hmm. where money's almost bad? Like if you had too much of it, you almost were categorized as like, eh, 
like kind of evil almost of like, oh, all those rich people, but like, oh, we're more modest and this is this is a better, healthier way. I think so. Yeah, that, you know, I'm never going to say that growing up upper middle class is a burden, right? But at the same time, when you're a church going Christian, you can learn to develop that shame around money. Yes. yes. And I think that was part of maybe what I was feeling in a residual way. Yep, absolutely. For sure. For sure. Yeah, there's a lot of toxic money messages uh, in different parts of life, but specifically, Mm -hmm. sadly, yeah, within the evangelical Mm -hmm. community, too, Mm -hmm. which I hate, but that's that's a real thing. Wow. So super interesting. That Mm. is interesting. I know Kevin at some point many years ago, let's say like eight-ish years ago, looked at me and said, you need to start spending money. Because like, I'm not kidding. I really wouldn't buy a water bottle if I was thirsty (laughs) and I was out. I'm like, I'm just going to go home and get it for free. Um, I was extreme. And he was like, if you don't start spending money and feeling your success you're going to be miserable because now you're just a workhorse and you're not seeing Mm. the fruits of your labor. So I remember him taking me shopping and saying, you need to buy that leather jacket you want, or you need to buy that, like whatever it is, that pair of shoes. And so, cause you know, when you're a celebrity too, people send you stuff. And I got stuck in that rut of people sending me things and me feeling guilty that, Mm. well, they just sent me this. I should like this. But it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I really liked. I just was making do. And then you just kind of, there's like, it almost like chips away little by little. You kind of like, what am I doing all this for? Why right. am I working so hard? And so he did I'll change curious, that. So for you, um, I find people that tend to be extreme savers, but they start to kind of open their hand and experience life, they become even more generous. Mm -hmm. So people that are natural spenders usually yield to more generosity. Like they're just like, oh yeah, yeah, if you need help, oh yeah, yeah, here, here, here. They're they're natural there versus when you kind of naturally live with a closed fist. So when you started to kind of open your hand and be like, okay, no, I'm going to actually enjoy the work that I've put into my life. Mm -hmm. Do you, did did that, did you feel any type uh, of generosity come out of that? I'm just curious, were you more apt to see something or hear something like, oh, that'd be cool to kind of get into and help with? I feel like I was always actually generous in terms of like giving to, you know, whatever, if someone was in need or something or like gifts and stuff, maybe I got better at it as time went on too. Um, so maybe, maybe I got even better at it. Um, or just more comfortable with money leaving. You know what I mean? I think yeah. it's that concept of just yeah. like, okay. I was always good at like everybody else, but terrified with myself. And like, yes. like I, the only way I could give is if I didn't take myself because then yes. I really was giving too much. So I'd be close fisted with myself. Um, yep. You know, like that was kind of my thing. But I think yeah, that makes sense. I think it is important to enjoy what you're you're doing and what you're making and so like like i'll give you an example so kevin and my dad did this renovation and we made everything like handicap accessible for my mom and all this stuff Mm. just in the nick of time ironically um but one of the big ticket items was the master closet now when we first moved into this house we did our first master closet we did it with ikea and it was amazing But now we're like looking at this and we're like, we don't know if we're going to live here. We might want to consider moving to Nashville, as I told you earlier. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. The world is shifting and changing so much. And so we have to think about kind of resale as well. And I was like, Kevin, I think we need to do like a real custom made closet. If a girl comes into this house, she wants to see the dream closet. That's what this house kind of dictates. And so I went to California Closets. And yes, you did. designed my kind of dream closet. It's literally, they're in my driveway right now, starting the install. Oh, right. And ironically, Kevin was laughing. He goes, of course, this is the most expensive thing we've done. <laughs> like we did I this mean... whole renovation for like peanuts. And this is the one thing. And he's like throwing up in his mouth. And so was I. But So this is where our relationship is weird because I was like, <laughs> I can do this for one tenth of the budget and only 5%. Of, of the people out there are going to know the difference between what I do and what I... I Not ju- true. I ju- when you ju- see the California closet, boo, you're going to okay. know the difference. Really? Like, after everything I've just pulled off in this house, honey, you really think... Honey, just trust I'm me. I'm telling you public... The textures, you can, the, you can, all the... You can go yeah. to Ikea and you find a way to judge it. Plenty of YouTube videos. Never mind. But anyway, you see the difference in our... Rela- like, where I am a spender, but I'm like, no, why... 
why spend there? I can do it and sit for a tenth of the budget. Anyway, so this is, That's our, so good. This okay, is why we're this. messed up. Because <laughs> in the money tendencies that I talk about, one of the things is spending on experiences versus things. Yeah. And so I would be curious if like either one of you guys being opposites, do you tend to put more value? Like I would rather spend money on a thing that I can reuse over yes. and over again yes. versus an experience, a nice dinner out or a vacation. That's just, it's gone. You have memories, but it's I'm gone. I'm experiences. And I'm, I'm things. And that's why the closet ultimately is a great idea <laughs> yeah. because we're going to use it every day. We're going to enjoy it every day. And yes. So I'm like hot tub. If you're going to use it every day, it's going to make you stronger, feel better. You do it. You spend, invest on yourself. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. where definitely I'm the things in she's experienced yes. yeah 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 because i definitely attract. took it i took it up a notch on the vacations and now you can't go down a notch once you've gone up oh it's so true <laughs> I, I'm a, I say i'm an accommodation snob now i'm like dang it Bad. once you stay at a good hotel i'm like i can't go back i just can't go back i can rent i'll rent like a small compact car to get to the nice hotel like uh -huh. there's like little things i'm like i will i will cheap out on some things not the accommodation so i'm with yeah. you maria for sure so now let's talk a little bit about how we kind of take where we grew up in our money classroom and how do we kind of push ourselves forward into yes. kind of achieving our dreams? Because that's what the book is about. For sure. Well, if you grew up in an anxious money classroom, you're going to have a natural tendency to back away from conflict. You're going to have a natural tendency to just really not engage because it almost feels better to be like, yeah, I feel tension, but like, I don't, I don't even want to know the truth. Like there's this like level that you feel this wall you have to break down. So if you grew up in that classroom, I would encourage you that you really do you have, for, for the verbal side of money, talking about money, that might be your biggest blocker. So learning how to communicate in your close relationships about money. If you grew up in the unstable money classroom, you, you know how to communicate probably because you heard it, whether it was healthy or not, but it was talked about, but to say, okay, how do I take that stress that I was feeling there and actually learn to control my money so that emotional stress goes down. And again, working with someone, whether it's a spouse or a good friend, but to really get you there. And then I would say that classroom number three, like we talked about earlier, but it is, it's gaining that knowledge. And, and a lot of people that grew up in this classroom, I find that if they married someone that was good with money, again, they kind of just were like, ah, eh, they can take care of it. Like they almost labeled the spouse, the money person, because it just kind of felt good to have your head in the sand and not have to worry where you have to engage. You have to learn, you have to communicate, you have to engage. And then that classroom number four, which who, there was someone that grew up in classroom number four. Who was it on your show? They just Kelsey. said it. It was Kelsey. 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 Hi. Kelsey. Okay, yes. Hey. <laughs> Kelsey, yes. So I grew up in classroom number four, too. Uh, and I would say, though, one of our things that we have to learn is that just because your parents were money smart doesn't mean you automatically get that gene. Like, you have to put in the work. And there's a level of entitlement mm -hmm. that can come with that classroom of like, oh, no, everything was controlled and great. And sometimes I heard the word no. It wasn't like you were given everything. But it was all fine. And you kind of expect that into adulthood. And I love the quote. Um, I can't remember who said it, Larry Burkett or someone that we spend the first five to seven years of our marriage trying to obtain the same standard of living as our parents. But it took our parents 30 years to get there. Mm. And so that classroom number four, we can fall into that. And so you have to break through, say, I am an independent person. Like once I'm out of my own. I'm the one that has to develop these skills that I've learned in my household, which I'm thankful for. But I actually have to put it into practice. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> I think you said something that's interesting is like when people put it on the spouse, everyone's like, oh, he handles the money. And and I think it's like a lot of women obviously do it, too. And it's it's something that now that I you know some spent, men do it, too, Maria. This is true, honey. Yeah, He does. He's like she handles all the money. But um, I am the right one to handle the money. <laughs> <laughs> she gets the good closets. Don't worry. <laughs> but I know how to make it and Maria knows how to save it. I know how to make it and save it, baby. But um, but I think it's really important. Really, 10 for... years ago when we tried to launch this show, do we really want to go down that path? Honey, I'm just saying the facts. I know how to make money and I know how to save money. Do you dispute that? Yes, I dispute the, the, the first part of it. I don't know how to make money? I think when you have the money, you mean how to invest it? No, I know how to make money. I earn a living. Okay. And can we, do we really want to go over with Rachel all the jobs you said no to that I had to like put on my hands and knees and beg you to do that ended up making you money? <laughs> okay. Must we do that? Let's move on. I don't think your fans <laughs> want to go over that list. Let's move on. Um, although it would be an interesting show. I think that it's really important to be educated yourself in how to be financially 
um, independent and what moves people are making and why. Like whenever I tell Kevin what we're doing, I explain it thoroughly so he understands. But I think it's it's a lot easier to learn than you think and you will feel so empowered and um, it's just so important. I wonder what advice do you have for people in 2021 in terms of investing where the markets at the end of 2020, I mean, I Insane. Yeah. am in absolute shock because I didn't see it going that way. Mm-hmm. And and maybe it's a delayed reaction that's going to come in 2021. I sure hope not. But it, it almost feels like the housing bubble happened and, and there is going to be a burst. I thought the burst was going to be in the fall of 2020. Am I crazy? Did you feel the same? No. Would well, you remember what? And I wish I, Heidi might be able to tell me what what month was I on the show with you? Because it, it was July? during April. The, oh, it was April. 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 Yep. April. Okay. It was the very beginning. Yeah. And I do remember talking to you because after I got done with the recording, I thought, oh gosh, I may have been so wrong because we talked about 08 versus what was going on during the pandemic. Do you remember that? And I said, I was like, I, I don't see it going like, oh, wait, I think it, we're going to be better off. I think we're going to be okay. And you're like, no, yeah. and I, was like, I don't know. So what's crazy is the unemployment stuff has not really recovered because those industries where that unemployment happens, they're not back. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, some, I mean, you know, Delta, I think they said is actually going to make money or something. I heard that on the news say, but like, like the, they're barely cream back, but, but the markets is usually a predictor of the future. It's like you said, went crazy. Like in December, I was like, what is happening? So, so yeah. So who knows what's going to happen? Thankfully that is good. And and that piece of advice we talked about on your show in April, I kept saying like, don't cash out of the market. Don't cash out, stay in, stay in, stay in, stay in, stay in. And so that is one thing that we learned is that yes, you, you have to ride that roller coaster because for investing, it should be long-term. It should be five years or more. And your retirement, if it's Roth IRA or 401k, it's for the long, long term, depending on your age. And so you let it ride it out. Cause if you look, at every little dip, you're going to freak yourself out mm-hmm. and you're going to pull it, pull that money. And then you're going to take those penalties and everything. And so writing it out is so, so key. So I think we talked about a little bit of that on your last show, but that would still be the same piece of advice I'd have today. Um, and thankfully it's recovered and more. I mean, you, if you, if you pulled out, you missed all that growth. Yeah. It's crazy. So if you pulled out or if you haven't gone in, what is your advice now? Yeah, I never, my, I always have a little bit of different financial advice than some people. So I always say specifically with real estate and investing, it's not market timing, it's your timing. So I want you out of debt. I want you to have a fully funded emergency fund of cash of three to six months of expenses. Once mm-hmm. you have all of that, whether the market's good or bad, start investing 15% of your income into retirement. Start investing. That's when you wanna look at, at you know getting in at that point. So it's less about what the market's doing it really is more about where you are financially. Because the hard thing is, yeah, if you had a 401k, but you had no um, you had no cash in the bank, 40% of Americans couldn't cover a $400 emergency in cash during the pandemic. So if you were one of the millions that was furloughed or laid off, that 401k doesn't do much for you. You do have to cash it out to avoid bankruptcy or foreclosure. And I don't want you to get to that point at all. So mm-hmm. having cash and no debt is a great place to be. I love it. Any last questions, guys? You know, the last thing I love, Rachel, is you talk in the book about fear over uh, faith over fear. And Mm. actually, that's a big recurring theme on our show is, you know, we have a lot of listeners from different faiths, but I know your faith is important to you. um, But can you talk about why fear is such a dangerous ingredient in our money journey and how we can find faith in ourselves or in whatever our higher power is to really to be smart and kind of hone our money personality, if you will? Yes. Yeah. Fear was really interesting for me because I really dove into this subject because fear dictates and motivates us a lot with what we do with our money. And Dr. Chip Dodd said to me on the phone during our interview, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's so good. He said, fear is actually a gift. So fear is your body's literal response that you are in need of something. Now, when that fear goes to the extreme or it goes into anxiety and it paralyzes you, that's unhealthy. I don't want that for you. But if you had a financial fear kind of rise up, specifically during 2020, listen to that. What was that telling you? So if it was the fear of the lack of security, like we just talked about, okay, if that's if that's your fear because it's your reality, let's do something about it. Let's get out of debt and get that emergency fund. If your fear is that, oh, I don't want to end up like my parents. Okay, let's put some things in place where you, that's not going to happen. So listening to that fear, not letting it paralyze you. It doesn't need to control you by any means. But when that fear rises up, being able to name it and say, okay, what can I do? And yeah, I mean, having faith in yourself, absolutely. So whether it's a big faith or you, I think it's, I think you need all of it because 
because you have the ability to change your life. Like that's the beautiful thing I love about personal finance. It's like you get to wake up tomorrow and there are things we can't control in our life that we've all experienced, but there are things we can control. And so to say, okay, what can you control? And focusing on that and kind of giving the power back to yourself in a way mm -hmm. to say, I have the ability to change, right? Like if you wanna get healthier, we know we you gotta eat less and exercise more. Doing it is hard, so that's a whole other conversation, actually putting it in place, but we know what to do. And so these, these principles we've talked about of living on a budget, getting an emergency fund, getting out of debt, getting yourself stable, we know we can do that, we can do that, but actually doing the action is what's so difficult, but believing I can, because in order to do those things, you have to sacrifice, right? You're not gonna just get out of debt just overnight. You're mm -hmm. not gonna just save up three months of expenses overnight, you have to sacrifice your lifestyle. Like there's elements and, and short-term sacrifice that go into play, but you have to have hope that what you're sacrificing for is so much better than your present. And I don't think pain has to be your only teacher, but it is a thorough teacher. So if you had these moments in 2020 and you're like, never again, let that man, let that be a stake in the ground and you, and you have the ability to do it because you have hope that what you're sacrificing for is so much better mm. than the stress and anxiety you have with money today. So good. I love that. Ra so Rachel, do you have, um, you know, with it being a new year, you know, do you, I mean, like, is there any quick steps somebody can take right, right now? I think like, this is the the time of year we always say I'm going to lose weight I'm going to do this and I and I feel like financial stability really I'm old-fashioned in that way as much as I'm talking about spending I feel like at your core it just helps provide so much peace and relief from anxiety and so many other things so like is there just a couple of quick steps you could give us that w where it's like it's we're just these next week we can just start to implement maybe and some of our fans can implement as well yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd say number one, start with a budget. It's the biggest mistake people make. They don't live intentionally with their income. They kind of just spend it with whatever. So being intentional. So a monthly budget is simply your income for the month minus all of your expenses, including giving and saving, but it all equals zero. So every dollar coming in from your paycheck is assigned to a category and it's going to take you three months <laughs> to get it right. So January may be a disaster. February is going to be a little tough, but by March, you're going to start to see consistency. So that budget, not make a budget tonight, get out a sheet of paper, get Excel out. I don't care. Just get that figure out. Okay. My income in January is probably going to be this minus here's what we usually spend. Go back and look at December or November or October of 2020 and see what you spent on out to eat, see what you spent on groceries, kind of look at your lifestyle. And then you probably have to cut from there in order to fit that in to your number, to your income. But starting that out, gosh, the budget would be my number one. And then number two within that budget to start to save. Again, majority of people can't even cover a $400 emergency. So get $1,000, let that be your goal and open up a savings account that's separate from checking, just a standard savings account and just start just putting a little bit of money in. Because once you see that you can actually do it, again, that's where the hope ignites. Because mm -hmm. if you're not saving, you feel like you'll never get there. But even if you just put a little bit away and you're like, oh wow, there's $300 in there or whatever it is, you actually feel like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. So that that's what I would say. I would say definitely be budgeting and start practicing saving uh, if, you've, if you're not in that habit because a lot of Americans aren't. And I think you're right. The emotions build because when you have that savings account, you start feeling better about yourself and you probably want to do more. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and would you, do you, do you believe in a, like a financial journal? I remember Maria used to do a food journal when she was losing weight. Do mm -hmm. you, what do you think about a financial journal where you write down literally everything you buy from gas to gum to anything, you know, when you're putting together this budget. Yeah, I think that that's a great way because you want to be able to track expenses. So I use an app every dollar and it's attached to my bank account. So anytime I swipe my debit card, my transactions just go right in so I can drag and drop it. Ooh. So however you can do that, but you want to track your expenses because to your point exactly, you can create a budget and then be like, okay, there it is. But you actually have to live on it. So you do have to track with what's going on. So whether that is, you know, journaling or keeping receipts or you get an app, that, that helps you do it, you know, um, in a technology way. It doesn't matter, but to keeping track, yes, 100%, you have to be able to do that, to know where you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives you accountability too, right? Like you get toward the end of January and you say, okay, we only have X amount left in our restaurant category. We're probably, we may, depending on how much is in there, we're gonna have to choose. So it just allows you to have limits and boundaries with your money, which mm -hmm. is so, so important. Yeah, and this and you, app don't is know, you don't know what you're spending because you're doing it so quickly, because now it's not even just cash, it's your apps, it's your, your Apple Pay, your Amazon, yes. whatever. And it's back to the diet thing, Kev, you said, in my first book, The Every Girl's Guide to Life, and the second one, The Every Girl's Guide to Diet and Fitness, I talked about how I lost weight, 
And it was, it was in January years ago. I wrote down everything I ate for a week down to the stick of gum. And then I was able to identify where my problem areas were. And Mm. then I was able to attack those problem areas. And then by the end of the year, I lost 40 pounds, but I was intentional about how I did it and thoughtful. And it's the same thing with money. If you know you're spending all your money going to 7-Eleven, buying little like junky things, then you can say, all right, it's going to be cheaper for me to you know, buy the snacks at the store, at, you know, at the supermarket and, you know, bagging them up or I don't know. Um, you can kind of look at your problem areas better. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. And when you see how much you spend on food, it's like, oof. <laughs> it's a lot if you're not keeping track. And so, yeah, even that simply just even where you grocery shop, right? Like making these little changes mm-hmm. is going to be huge over time. You're exactly right. Yeah. So the app is called every dollar that you like every dollar. Yes. So there's a free version and then a paid version. Uh, but I love it because it, yeah, it, all my transactions come in and you'd be so proud. I'm a spender. But when those come in, I'm like, oh, I'm going to know exactly where I'm at. And I just mm-hmm. drag and drop those transactions. And it's great. Rachel, have you ever used mint yes i have is it similar i like i do like mint for the overall picture they do a good job like because you can put in your worth of you know your car and your house like it gives you a really big picture but i like every dollar on the day-to-day because it's it's a better transaction to keep that monthly budget no i'm Mm -hmm. glad you brought that up because mint is another fun app that i used to use but it was almost it was overwhelming because it didn't track the day-to-day Yes. Yeah. It's a good picture to see your whole financial life, if you will. Um, But I like every dollar for the for the monthly budget. Awesome. I love it. Well, Rachel, where can I bet if they go to rachelcruz.com, not only can they take the quiz there, but I bet um, you can also get kind of on track. You can buy the book, which comes out today. It's called um, where why am I blinking on the name of the book? Know Yourself, yourself, Know Your your Money. money. (laughs) I'm like, wait, why am I blanking? Uh, Know yourself, know your money. But also I'm sure, you know, they can sign up for more classes and such to kind of get themselves on track, right? Yes, absolutely. Yep. All resources are there for sure. And you can buy the book anywhere books are sold. Thank you, Jeff, because I left mine um, in my foyer as I was running out. I used the restroom and then I forgot it. But um, but, uh, know yourself, know your money. Rachel Cruz, thank you so much as always. Oh, thank you, Maria. Thanks for having me on. It's always so fun. I appreciate it. If you come to Nashville, we'll have a glass of wine. For It'll be fantastic. Sure. <laughs> for sure. Thank you thank so you much. Guys. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate it. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.